Each Sunday, we dedicate our gifts. We bring them before the Lord. Now, some of you aren't able to physically bring them here into the sanctuary. Some of you aren't able to bring them physically to the property, but maybe you've made a financial gift, uh, mailed it in an envelope, or have done it through bank draft, and the bank has sent a, a gift, or you've gone online and used um, a credit card. But we recognize that our gifts aren't just financial. And quite often, they're not even tangible. We understand that our giving is really what's coming from our hearts. It's our sacrifice to the Lord as we give from ourselves. And so you don't have to be here in the sanctuary. You don't have to be on the property to do that act of giving, to perform a sacrifice. You can be in your living room today. You can be standing in the kitchen. You can be in your car. Any time that we, in our hearts, commit ourselves to the things of ministry, it's our offering. And so today, right now, we dedicate those gifts before the Lord. Let's pray together. Holy God, we thank you for all that you've done for us. For all that you've done for us in the name of Jesus Christ and by his blood. With humble hearts. With a deep feeling of gratitude. We seek to do something for you. Not to buy your favor, not to earn our salvation, but out of joyful response, from cheerful hearts, we give of ourselves for the sake of your church. For your church locally, for Scotch Plains Baptist, for the place where we choose to worship and fellowship, but also for your church universal, those called out in the name of Jesus. And for the work of the church, meeting needs, Demanding justice, bearing witness to the hope and the love in the name of Jesus, for calling others to a salvation experience. We give to the work of discipleship and education, of growth individually and corporately. Father, we give ourselves to these causes. We give ourselves to serving the needs of our community, physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, to serving our neighbors, our brothers and sisters. We give ourselves to proclaiming the name of Jesus so others may come to know. And these gifts we dedicate even now. We offer them to you. We give them with no strings attached. And ask, Father, that you use them as you will. Where you will. When you will. According to your will. These things we give. And offer them. In the name of Jesus Christ. We're going to turn to our hymn. In the hymnal, it's number 738. We've also printed it in the worship packet. And if you've received the worship packet and you have the hymnal and you compare, the words are different. Now, this is a song that I did not even realize was going to have different variations. Jesus Loves Me is one that many of you learned as children. You learned very young. And because you learned it young, you came to think of it as a children's song. And I'm going to tell you, I don't think it is. I think it's easy for children to sing. It's easy for children to understand, or at least begin to understand. But this is a song that meets the needs of adults as well. 
A song that I think we can sing in our entire lifespan. And frankly, when our lives are coming to an end, this song works. And so we sing this not on Children's Sunday. We sing this today not as part of a kid's sermon but a reminder that we come to Christ in a childlike faith and that he has something to teach when we're young and when we're not so young. I want you to join me in singing Jesus Loves Me. as little children. We come to him in our weakness and we rely on his strength. It reminds us that someday he will call us home. And that in that, there is nothing to fear. As we go to prayer today, I have to let you know that um, there has been a death in our church family. Um, not a member of our congregation, but certainly a part of our church family. Um, Florence, the sister of Pat Jackson and Joan Davenport, many of you have known Florence some uh, for years, some a lot longer than I have. Um, she passed, and um, it was kind of quick. It wasn't sudden, but it was quick. 
I'm always stuck in those situations. Because it seems like it's too fast. But when we get there, it's with a sense of peace. Now, I, I'm not here to eulogize Florence, but I, I do want to tell you this. If you know Florence, you know this is true, and if you don't know her, this is something you need to know about her. She was an encourager. She was an incredibly positive person. She was someone who got things done and encouraged others to get things done. And I just want to say that when Florence was here in our congregation, I think she always had positive things to say. And I, I think that was just who she was. I believe that, and I'm not going to do this, but I believe that if I were to deliver the sermon by reading the phone book in a bad English accent, that after the service, Florence would come up to give me a hug and say, that was awesome. That's who Florence was, at least from my perspective. She will be missed. We ask you to continue to keep the family in prayer. We remind you to keep in prayer our nation, particularly as we uh, approach an election. I know that many of you, um, like myself, have already uh, voted. Uh, and I know that even that process is one that has had some angst and turmoil involved in it. I'm concerned, and I shared this recently, I'm concerned with how factions within our nation are going to react no matter the outcome of this vote. I hope that you are praying with me for peace. That we have peace. That we recognize our democratic process for what it is. And we recognize that not everybody who votes is going to have their vote be for the winning side. I recently read something on one of the local social media that proclaimed, if you vote in this way, it is an act of hate. I gotta believe that most of my neighbors, most of the folks in my community, most of my fellow countrymen are not voting out of hate, but are voting out of genuine, felt, Needs. They're seeking to the, do the best with their vote that they can. And that after the election, they remain our neighbors, our community members, and our countrymen. I hope that you are praying with me during this time. We're also praying for certainly those who are dealing with this pandemic, whether it be that they are physically dealing with an illness themselves, if they are dealing with, with job loss, with job insecurity, if they are dealing with challenging home life, childcare, schooling, education, we know that there are so many threads in this tapestry and that it doesn't take much to start it unraveling. Pray with me for folks during this pandemic. We certainly have folks who are hitting life milestones, weddings, graduations, the start of school, enlistment in the military, retirement. And we know it's different. And so we season our prayers for those folks. There's a lot of things that you've been praying for, some that you've written down, you shared with the church, some that have gone out from the church, some that you received through a phone call, and some you've sent an email to. We lift all these prayers together. Will you join with me as we pray? Holy God, we thank you. We thank you because we know you hear our prayers. We know you hear our prayers, whether they are spoken with our mouths, if they're mumbled during our private time, if they're written in our prayer journal, you hear it. When it's written on our heart, you hear our prayer. And when the best we can do 
is from a muddled mind and a challenged heart groan and call out to you, my God, you have heard the entirety of our prayer. When we think we know what we are praying for, what we are praying about, you already know deeper than we do. Your understanding goes beyond ours. And when we pray for someone that we care about, we know that your love goes even beyond ours. And so we bring our prayer, confident that you hear, that you love us, and that you act in our best interest. And so, Father, sometimes we come and we want to tell you how to do things. We want to tell you how to deal with our needs, how to meet our challenges. But we've learned that we don't know as much as we think we do. And that your ways are always better than ours. And so we bring our concerns and we, we might have our thoughts on what to do, but we pray in keeping with your will because we trust you. You never have failed us yet. And so we pray not by my will, but by you. And Father, even now, we give you praise. We give you praise even before we have your answer. Because you've never failed us yet. And we know your good will for us. And so we praise you in all circumstances. Father, hear the prayers of our lips and the prayers of our heart. Offered according to your will. In the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's service is going to be a little bit different. I sent out earlier this week scripture from the Gospel of Matthew. Many of you, as you read the scripture, or as you hear it now, will recognize the Beatitudes and recognize that this is, in fact, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, that Sermon on the Mount doesn't necessarily flow smoothly from section to section, but it's a series of vignettes, of small pieces of important information for us. And the scripture that we have today is from Matthew chapter 5, it's going to be the first 16 verses. And it has the Beatitudes, and then it has some language that is good church language, and we use it all the time. But it's language we need to be reminded that we don't need just the language, but to act on the instruction that's given. Our scripture from the Gospel of Matthew. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds... He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice. And be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. I had thought to share this as kind of a pre-election scripture. That this should be our attitude in the coming days. A reminder of how we should be. And, and actually, if we do these things, the blessing that we receive. And frankly, a lot of this stuff I've heard lately, does not seem to be pointing to this kind of blessing. And I think it's a good reminder for us. And I think at the end, after the Beatitudes, when we read about being salt and light, it's a reminder that we don't just use those as words, but we endeavor to be salt, to be light, that we're not satisfied, that we're constantly moving forward in them. And that it's our desire that in all we do to let our light shine, that others may see, and that they may, by seeing, glorify our Father in heaven. That's the end of that mini sermon. I leave it with you. You've heard this before. This isn't new language. But perhaps it's a time to reflect on it a little more deeply. For the remainder of our sermon, our message time, we're going to do something a little bit different. Now, I know for a lot of you, you're going to say it's a lot different. And I know. But I think it's something that is worth sharing. Now earlier when we sang Jesus Loves Me, we talked about how that's a kid's song, but it's really not. That it's a hymn of faith. Something from which we can take encouragement and be reminded and learn how to live. What's about to happen next might seem like it's a children's sermon. It is, but it's so much more. It's a reminder about our entire life of faith in Jesus Christ. It comes in the form of a parable. Now, Jesus told all sorts of parables. He took everyday things and situations and said, the kingdom of heaven is like He would tell a story to which his hearers were to find a spiritual meaning. Common things. Sheep. Vines. Orchards. A lost coin. And he would give them meaning. It was meant to leave with you an understanding that perhaps maybe someday when you were walking down the road and you saw a sheep that seemed to be lost, you would remember his story about the shepherd going after the one sheep. And so what I'm going to share with you today is meant as a parable. It's meant to give you something everyday, common experience and allow you to see a spiritual message to it. 
that perhaps what you see now, when you see later, will allow you to see spiritually. And you're used to doing that, aren't you? I mean, you're used to this symbol that's behind me. It's just two lines that intersect. But you see that symbol and you are reminded that Jesus died for you. Now, I'll be honest. Sometimes that symbol is merely a decoration. Hung in somebody's house because somebody gave it to them as a housewarming gift. Or it was a wedding present. And they hung it up on the wall. And it's a mere decoration. Sometimes it's mere decoration around our necks. Hanging from a chain. A fashion state. Sometimes it's inked onto our bicep. And we, we did that as a reminder that Jesus is my strength. But And I don't have that. But then it just becomes a tattoo with a couple of others. But on a good day, when we're spiritually hitting on all cylinders, we see those intersecting lines. And it moves us. It takes us to a spiritual place and a reminder of who Jesus is. And so today, some symbols that hopefully will move you to a spiritual place. Now, I've got to do a little something here. I've got to lose the jacket. I feel kind of like Mr. Rogers at the moment. My wife earlier told me that with the bow tie, it's more like Bill Nye, the science guy. And something that I don't often do in the service, I've got to roll up my sleeves. Something to be said for that, isn't it? Spiritually, there are times that we got to take off the jacket and roll up the sleeves. Because we know things are about to get a little messy. I wonder if when we went to prayer, if we spiritually rolled up our sleeves instead of just showing up in our Sunday best, if we recognize how messy things were going to get. We're almost there. When's the last time you carved a pumpkin? Some of you have grown children, and you can remember a time when you carved a pumpkin. Some have young children, and you might be doing this this week. Some of you are saying, you know what? As Christians, I'm not carving a pumpkin. That Halloween thing, that's the devil's holiday. I gotta tell you, I struggle with that a little bit. I'm not a fan of Halloween. To be honest with you, I'm not a fan of a lot of the themes of Halloween. I'm okay with dressing up and creativity and uh, role playing. Not real thrilled with ghosts. Creating scenes of death and gore and violence. But you know what? A, a pumpkin? It's something natural God gave us. And like anything, we can use any tool that he gave us for good or bad. And if I can use a pumpkin, that my neighbor might be carving to look like Dracula, and I can carve it to express a spiritual point. I don't think God has a problem with that. I think Jesus took the every day. He took the things that he would see. He, took, he would take the things that you would see driving down your street today. And he could look at it and say, now that, I can see the kingdom of heaven. Now I'm going to tell you, 
any parable breaks down the benchmark. We have to be careful that when we read a parable that Jesus spoke, that we don't try to add too much to it, to take it too far. It's just, in this way, it's like this way. So I've got my pumpkin. Now, I did not go out to a pumpkin patch to get it. When Ashley was little, we used to do that a lot. We'd go to a pumpkin patch and go out to the field and find the pumpkin on the vine and take it in, pay for it, take it home, paint it or carve it. And Ashley always loved that. I think kids like that kind of thing. And Ashley, when she was little, always went to the great big pumpkin. And there's a side of me, that, that kind of soft spot that dads had, to say, yeah, I want to get my kid the biggest pumpkin. But then there was that soft spot in my wallet that said, how am I going to get that biggest pumpkin? So we had a little rule in our family. You can get a pumpkin as long as you can carry it. It's amazing how many big pumpkins got put back down on the ground for a smaller one that she could handle. But we would search it out. We'd look for it. But even right there, I'm reminded that searching for a pumpkin reminds us that God came looking for us. Jesus came find us. And when he finds us, he searches us. First scripture that I want to share with you today from Psalm 139, verse 1. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Take a kid out to the pumpkin patch and they pick up a beautiful pumpkin and you turn it around and on the back there's a big rotted spot. Now it takes a little search, a little get to know that. Or there's a gash on the side. God has searched us. And he knows us. He knows our flaws. He knows our rotten spots. He knows where life has gashed us. And he sees things beyond what you and I can see. Our second passage from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He knows things about me that you will never know. He searches me and knows me. Now, one of the things that when he searches that he knows is our sin. He knows the sin that we've kept hidden from everybody else. He knows the sin that we're not even willing to admit to ourselves, and he knows those sins that we don't even recognize we did. How often have we stumbled into something and not recognized it? And only later realized a sin of omission or commission that we did something we shouldn't have or that we left something undone, that we left something out. He knows all those things. Romans 3, 23. Why do you have this one memory? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He knows that we are creation, but fallen. That we are filled with sin. And later in Romans, also at 23, 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. He wasn't willing to leave. He had something better in mind for us. He knows what's in our hearts and knows the corruption. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 3. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil. And there is madness in their hearts while they live. And after, they join the dead. Jesus knows that about us. When he searches us to know us, he knows that we are sinners. That we are full of sin. That there is madness in our hearts. And when it's all over, we die. And he was not willing for that to be. 
He also knows that we can't do anything about it on our own. From Ephesians, I almost said Ephesians, that would have been an interesting one. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We can't get ourselves there, but he can. He wants to. Wow, all these E's together. Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 25 through 27. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my law. He knows who we are. He wants something better. He knows we can't do it, so he says, I will do it. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. I will remove from your heart of root from your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you. See, we read that verse from Romans chapter six, that twenty-three, Romans six twenty-three. For the wages of sin is death. The verse continues, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. He searches us. He knows us. He knows our sin. He wants something better. He knows we can't do it. He knows that we've earned death. There is madness in the hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Our Lord. There's a catch. We've got to let him We've got to let him do this work. When he says, I will cleanse you from your impurities, he does not force that on us. He does not make us little robots. He waits. He's there, waiting, ready, but needs you to invite him in. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Well, it's time. We've searched out and we found our pumpkin. We know about it. And we know what needs to be done. And it's time. we got to open them up. Now, traditionally, and I know many of you are traditionalists, you cut around the stem you cut a little notch so there's a chimney for the candle that you put inside. I don't use candles. So I don't have to have a chimney. I don't have to have an escape. So I'm going to cut from the bottom. Now, when I talk to kids about this, I remind them that use a safety knife and that children should not use a knife without parents helping without a grown-up because even grown-ups can make a slip oh. we're reminded that we got to clean up the inside Ezekiel 36, that we read, I will cleanse you from all impurities. We need to be cleaned up. We pray from Psalm 51, we pray this simple prayer, create in me a clean heart, O God. Psalm 51, 10. And we allow him in. We give him access so that he can clean out all that yucky stuff. All the gross things that we can't do on our own, he can handle.
Psalm 103, verse 12 says, He has taken our sin away from us. We thank him for what he does. We could not do this. We sometimes kind of convince ourselves we can, that if we just pray hard enough, we can get things right. If we just work a little more, if we give money to the church, to a charity, if we show up and teach a Sunday school class, that somehow we can do our penance, we can purge ourselves from unrighteousness. But we can't. Only through Jesus Christ can our sin be removed. And the Bible tells us that it's not just removed, it's removed as far as the east is from the west. When I was a kid, my father bought an album by Mike Warnke, a Christian comedian an evangelist. And it stuck with me, that verse. That he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. And what stuck with me is the line that Mike Warnke used when he said, and that's not like the east is from the west when we're looking at a globe. Because eventually it comes back to that. But east from the west in a straight line. That seems kind of obvious. But then he pointed out something else. That straight line has no end. That there's no way to find the end of east to west. When he removes our sin, there's no, no way to catch it up again. He doesn't drop it somewhere that we can backtrack and find it. When he takes our sin from us, it's gone as far as the east is from the west. Now, I think we're pretty good here. It's fairly clean. And isn't that part of our Christian experience as well? That we get fairly clean and this one, we think we had it all. We find a little something else. Something that we hid away. Something that we tucked deep into our heart. And we carried that sin because we weren't ready to let it go. That's part of our Christian maturity, isn't it? That we recognize that we never get to the point where there is no sin left. But that any sin that we're willing to turn over to him, He'll take it from us. And so we could keep on cleaning this, and it would be my tendency to keep scraping, cleaning a little bit more, but I know you're already watching the clock. Created me a clean heart, oh God. The next thing I like to do when I carve a pumpkin is start with the mouth. Now, I told you that I don't like the scary stuff of Halloween. So I don't think I ever carve a scary mouth. I don't carve fangs. I don't carve angry. I carve a smile. I carve a happy. Because if my pumpkin is going to be telling the gospel is going to be telling the good news. There should be a smile involved there. Our faith should not be a scary thing. We shouldn't be trying to scare people into the kingdom, but rather attract them. Let's face it, there's not much that's more attractive than a smile that's welcoming. And so when I carve this, I want to give them a nice toothy smile. 
Now, I don't guarantee that every tooth I plan to put there is going to end up there. Sometimes, in my haste, I remove one that was not part of my consideration. Scripture tells us in Psalm 40, verse 30, he has put a new song in my mouth. A new song in my mouth. He's taken what is old, he's taken my lament and given me praise. Now, I don't know much about music. But I do remember this from when I was in youth choir. That you sing best when you open your mouth. Seems kind of obvious, doesn't it? But sometimes we try to sing the gospel with closed mouths. There's something to be said for opening wide. Our choir director, I remember, used to say, sing like you've got a light bulb in your mouth and you don't want to smash it. I think our testimony should come from wide open, smiling faces. Another verse from Proverbs says, a happy heart makes a face cheerful. I mean, sometimes you see some folks and you just look at them and say, man, that person needs to be happy. What is wrong? Because you miss the smile. Our faith, if we want to be attractive in our faith, if we want people to know Jesus the way we do, we should make it appealing. If we really have a happy heart, if we really have a change inside, they should tell by seeing our face. All right. He might need some orthodontia later on, but for now he looks pretty good. Just seeing a jack o' lantern gives you an opportunity to tell people about what Jesus does. That he puts a new song in us. He cleans out. He removes our sin. Replaces our dirge. Our lament. With praise. All the chunks that went inside. He's getting there. Not the best smile ever, but he's getting there. Now, I want to share another verse with you. If I find where I put my knife. Another verse from Hebrews, oh no, I'm sorry, from Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 26. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my way. My son, give me your heart. That's what he promises. He says, I will cleanse you from all impurities. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. We say, create in me a clean heart. He says, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my way. A reminder that even eyes are important. They have a spiritual aspect to them. That what we turn our eyes to is what draws us. You know, they've done studies on how many highway accidents happen that seem to make no sense at all. Where a, an emergency vehicle is on the side of the highway and somebody coming down the highway, a multi-lane highway, runs into the vehicle. With all those flashing lights, how can that possibly happen? Well, where we turn our eyes is where our focus goes, where our attention goes. And even when those lights are there as a warning for us, sometimes we are drawn unintentionally right into them. We need to make sure that we turn our eyes to Jesus, that we run into him.
There's another verse that reminds us from Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, every eye will see him. There will come a time when everyone's focus will be on Jesus Christ. The question is, when will that time come? And we'd rather that we have that opportunity now than rather in the after. That we can choose him now. That our eye will see him and we will be drawn to him. One of the things we do as Christians is seek to draw the eye to Christ. So we have to look and say, now the things that we're doing are they attracting people to the right thing? So even this time of year, as you decorate, what's the message your decoration is giving? Are you drawing the eye to Jesus or moving away from him? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. So, we've got some eyes going on there. We're getting there. Now, when I want a car for kids, the next thing they always say is the nose. And of course, you got to have a nose. I agree with that. That makes perfect sense. But one of the challenges for me, the word nose is not in the Bible. I mean, it's hard to kind of come up with a Bible verse about nose when there are no Bible verses about your nose. And unfortunately, children don't always get my sense of humor. I know you don't always get it either. So the verse that I often use here is from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. The Lord knows his children. Okay. I'll pause while you laugh at that one. Pause longer for some of you to catch up to it. He knows his children. That's part of him searching us out. That he knows who we are. He knows all about us. He knows those who are called by his name. Now there's another verse that I often use right after that one. And it could be a little disconcerting. They are a fragrant offering pleasing to God. That's from Philippians chapter 4, 18. If I run that together too much, it doesn't sound very good. The Lord knows his children. They are a fragrant offering pleasing to God. Children are not a fragrant offering. Uh, anything there. They're fragrant, um, but not pleasing. Um, but it's really in that Philippians passage. It's a reference to the gifts that we offer up. That the gifts we offer up are a pleasing, or a fragrant offering pleasing to God. Now, we have to remember that sometimes God says, Your offering stinks. And other times He says, it's pleasing. I desire it. And what makes the difference? The difference is not in the offering itself. It's in our heart. It's in our heart condition as we have given it to him. What is our purpose? What is our meaning? Why are we giving it? And when we get our heart right, anything we offer to him becomes a pleasing fragrance. So we ask him to continue to do a work in us. To continue to do a work in our lives. To do a work in our hearts. That all that we offer him is a pleasing fragrance. That everything that we give to him, he's glad to receive. I always feel weird when I'm using this part because it feels like I'm picking his nose. Sorry. All right, so got a nose. All right. Now, the 
next one is ears. And ears are very hard to carve into a pumpkin. I don't know if you ever tried such a thing. Um, it just doesn't work very well. But if I do what I'm trying to do correctly, we might have an attempt at this. Throughout the Gospels, we hear the same refrain over and over. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. We recognize that sometimes we have ears and we hear, but we don't listen, we don't heed. It makes no difference. It's kind of like, as a parent, when you tell your child to take out the garbage, and the fifth time you tell them, take out the garbage, and they yell back, I heard you! But they didn't take out the garbage. Well, we need to hear the things Jesus says but also heed them. We need to pay attention to it. And so the New Testament, or the Gospel, put that phrase out there over and over and over again as a reminder to us to listen, to really listen. I mean, right now you're hearing me talk about carving a pumpkin. But if you listen, there's a lot more going. Do you have ears to hear? Another verse is about hearing. From Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 13, children must hear about God. Well, sometimes it's hard to get their attention. Sometimes it's hard to get our attention. I think that's why Jesus told parables. They catch our attention. They're easily relatable. Children need to hear about God, Deuteronomy 31, 13. Right here, in carving a pumpkin, something that they might be doing anyway, is an opportunity every step of the way to allow them to hear about God. Now, the next one I'm guessing a lot of people don't do, and that's hair. Hair on a pumpkin. Now, typically when I say hair on a pumpkin, people, their expectation is that I'm going to take some of this goop and plop it over the top. But I actually have a different tool. I don't know how well you can see that. It actually removes, it's almost like a vegetable peeler, a very narrow vegetable peeler. And if I do this right, and again, absolutely no promises that I'll do it right, is I can remove big strips from this guy and make it look like hair. Now, I'll be honest with you. There's no good way to bring it all together in the, in the center. And I used to kind of feel bad about that, but then I recognized, nah, he just has a bald spot, and there's nothing wrong with a bald spot. One of those verses that always gives me a bit of a challenge when I read it, because I feel left out sometimes, is the reminder that from Matthew chapter 10, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Some of us, that's a little easier. I just try to think I'm trying to make God's job easy. The very hairs of your head are numbered. Now, the follow-up to that, because we often quote that part, but we kind of leave out the next part of it. It's in that whole section where he's trying to tell us to not be anxious about anything. But the next part of that verse is particularly appropriate this time of year. As we approach Halloween and we approach haunted houses and ghost stories, we're reminded that the very next phrase 
Even the hairs of your head are all numbered, period. So don't be afraid. God knows because he searched us. He knows all about us. He knows everything about us. And because he loves us, he cares for us. There's nothing sneaking up behind us that he does not know about. There's nothing that is beyond his protection. He knows his children. He's counted the hairs of our head. Do not be afraid. This is a season when a lot of people are trying to get a good scare, where they want to talk about fear. That, and I'm not just talking about Halloween. I'm talking about the news. There's a lot that wants to scare you. God's counted the hairs on your head. He knows you intimately. Do not be afraid. I don't know if I can hold this up if you can kind of see his hair. Now, on that subject of fear, Psalm 118, verse 6, the Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. And then in Proverbs 3, 24, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. Particularly with kids this time of year, you can give them some of those things that make them lie down and they're concerned about what's under the bed or in the closet or outside the window. That shadow that has never bothered them before, that shadow across the wall is all of a sudden something frightening. God does not give us a spirit of fear. In him, when we lie down, we do not need to be afraid. Now, we're just about done. We took a pumpkin and we made something different from it. Now, you might be used to calling this a jack-o'-lantern. I like to call it a Jesus lantern. Because everything that we did reminds us of Jesus. Everything we did is an opportunity to tell the story of Jesus, to give the good news of the gospel. That as we walk down the street and see it in someone's house, we can remind ourselves, he cleaned me out. He gave me a new heart. He gave me a new song in my mouth and a mouth to praise him, ears to hear him, eyes to see him. And he knows the number of hairs on my head. But there's something missing. There's something that needs to happen. You've got to have a light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He also told us in that scripture we read earlier today, let your light shine before men. Let your light shine before men. Matthew 5, 16. Oh, the, I didn't give you John 8, 12 when I said, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. That's John 8, 12. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. God made his light shine in us. He gave us light. Right before that, it says, for God who said, let, shine, let light shine out of darkness. Jesus, the word of creation, let there be light. That same God made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge, the glory of God in the face of Christ. Let your light shine. I have to do one more thing here. I can't make it absolutely dark. It's just not going to work. But a reminder that when Jesus died for us, when he was on the cross doing his work, Mark 15, 33 says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. In just a moment, we're going to sing this little light of life. Again, it seems like a child's song, but it's a proclamation of our faith. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Before we get there, though, one more thing I want to share with you. Some people try to do this 
without Jesus. They try to fake it. They try to put that smile on their face. Kind of like this guy here. He's got a smile. But I got to tell you, he hasn't been cleaned out on the inside. He doesn't have a new heart. And as much as it might look good, there is no light in this pumpkin. The light isn't there. Jesus, the light of the world, has not entered. And so there's no light to shine before men. We have to be cautious. When we claim to be Christians, when we claim to know Jesus, but we've never allowed him in. He stood at the door and knocked. We've acknowledged he's there, but we didn't let him in to clean us on the inside. Our sin has not been removed. And that smile on our face is not from a cheerful heart. It's hiding our deceit. And our eyes might be looking around, but they're really not focusing on Jesus. And we have no light to shine. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for something as simple as a pumpkin that can remind us of your love, can remind us of your kingdom, can point us back to you. We ask that even this simple story may be a blessing in our hearts and in our lives and a reminder to us as we share the good news of Jesus Christ. As we, as salt and light, let our light shine before all mankind. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. I hope you'll join me in singing this little light of mine. Again, I find all sorts of verses, all sorts of um, adaptations of changes. So I've printed some in your worship packet. We're going to sing the, the basic stanza that everybody knows. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You repeat that and then repeat it again. And then let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. We're then going to go with the verses that I kind of grew up with. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. That's right out of that Sermon on the Mount there. So we're going to sing that line three times. Hide it under a bushel? No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Uh, don't let anything blow it out. Now, i got to tell you, when I was growing up, it was don't let Satan blow it out. And you would blow with your finger. You'd hold your finger like that and blow it. I like don't let anything blow it out. Now, you can say, well, anything that's blown it out is from Satan, but sometimes it's everyday stuff that we don't see the devil in it, but we let stuff blow our life. Don't let anything blow it out. Three times, let it shine, let it shine. Um, let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. And then the last verse, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Now, one of those things that I read, and perhaps you, you read, was that you really can't just sing this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. If you mean it, you really got to shout it. So when we get to that last verse, I want you to sing that for all you've got. Now, fair warning, my microphone is going to be on. I'm going to move away from it, but it's going to be on, and I'm going to be shouting. And I don't sing well when I'm trying to sing. If I'm trying to sing shout, who knows what's going to happen. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine.
today. Thank you for hearing a new story, ah, an old story, in a new way. May you use it to share the love and the light of Jesus Christ. Receive now the benediction. Now, as you go about your lives, as you walk along the way, continue to tell the story of Jesus Christ. Continue to share the good news. Continue to let your light shine and shout in the name of Jesus. And in that name, be a blessing, and be blessed. Amen.